Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Ashish. Good morning, sir. Very good morning, Ashish, sir. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Professor Depra. We are indeed overwhelmed to see you. You are truly passionate and a thorough committed professional. I must confess the kind of passion and enthusiasm and time commitments you have, they are worth salutation. Well, sir, we can go ahead with our audio test if you wish. I'm absolutely fine with it. Perfect. Good to see you, Professor. Your presentation Dana. is visible, sir. Namaskar, yeah. sir. I am so Namaskar. delighted to have you here. Likewise. Can you can you see uh, me? Sir, you need to unmute yourself. You are not audible. At the center of the page, uh, on the left, there would be an unmute button. I have already unmuted. It is showing that my audio is. No, sir. Uh, uh, you, your voice is not audible, sir. Uh, Asisa, we can hear, sir. We can hear you, sir. Digvijay ji, can you help, sir, about uh, unmuting himself? Somebody, somebody said that they can hear me clearly. The yes, participant said we can yes. hear the sir. We can yeah. hear him. Yes, yeah. we can hear. Yes, yes, we can hear you, the sir. Uh oh, Professor oh, Daya, good morning, is good morning, sir. Sir, is audible. I'm I'm so sorry. I forgot to uh, plug in my earphones, and, and, and I said, <laughs> you, "You are quite audible, sir." I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, is my video clear? Absolutely, sir. It's absolutely Perfect. clear. Perfect. So, well, uh, you are the boss. Whenever um, you know you command me to get started, I will. So oh, I sir. Will we... Put myself on mute for now. We, we are so humbled and honored having you uh, in this uh, one week FTP. So let me apprise you that uh, yesterday we started with this FTP. This is first of its kind on life skills and soft skills. Of course, you have always been mentoring, guiding and helping us. Uh, so when we planned this FTP, uh, we uh, had uh, interaction with you. You were uh, supportive right from the planning stage. And uh, I'm happy that this Center for Life Skills and Soft Skills of uh, MD University Rotak, uh, it's a very new center. And in the first year itself, uh, we could back three FTPs uh, from AICT Atal. And all three of them are on life skills. Uh, first is interdisciplinary. Then second, we have in the month of September. It is in collaboration with Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences of our university. So those are life skills uh, for pharma professionals. And the third, we have it in the month of December. So that is uh, the advanced version of uh, the same. Uh, but there would be some uh, major concentration on hospitality and tourism professionals. Uh, I am delighted to share with you, sir, that we have very enthusiastic participants. 
who have joined from 20 different states of country and uh, many of them are in education system. So some of them are professors, some of them are associate, associate professors, some of them are assistant professors. In uh, diverse domains, we have from artificial intelligence, we have from pharmacy, we have from commerce, we have from management, we have from hospitality, tourism, uh, we have from robotics, we have from uh, uh, communication technology, and so and so and so. Apart from it, there are uh, friends who have joined from military engineering services, from different ministry departments. Department. And uh, uh, there are certain assistant directors and deputy directors uh, from different universities and other secretaries. Uh, besides this, we have passionate research scholars and uh, some PG students also who have enrolled in this program. So that's how this make uh, this group a diverse one. And uh, who else could be a better person to tell us about effective communication in online and hybrid classrooms? The one who has traveled so many countries across the globe and uh, is a professor of legacy and uh, uh, knows diversity very well. And the person who uh, uh, is delivering uh, education uh, on quality par excellence. So our gratitude to you, sir. I am delighted to have uh, our friends who have joined this session. Uh, Ajay is here along with Ajay Amit ji, uh, Anita ji, Anuj Mittal ji, Arun Kumar, Ashish Kumar, Ashun Tomar. We welcome Colonel Sanjeet Sirohi. Sir, we welcome you to uh, this session of uh, Professor Depra. Uh, Deepti ji, uh, Dr. Ajay Bhardwaj, Dr. Naveen Kumar, Dr. Rashmi. Then uh, we have Dr. Richard, Dr. Anup Kumar, uh, Professor Pipra, uh, you have met uh, Dr. Anup Kumar during your last visit to our university. He is my colleague. Uh, sir, I am muting everyone for a while. Uh, I think somebody has forgotten to unmute himself. Digvijay ji, kindly give me the rights of co-host so that I can mute or maybe you can do it on your behalf. Then we have Kumar Satyam, Dr. Jeshri, Dr. Dipanchu, uh, then Dr. Chaitanya, Dr. Monika, Dr. Richa, Dr. Ruchira, Dr. Shivani, Dr. Swati, Dr. Vijayarathi, Dr. Nidhi. Well, uh, let me also confess that it's absolutely fine in case if you have forgotten to unmute your mic and there are some disturbances or noises from the home. We all are working in a different environment. It's quite acceptable. Only request humbly is just to mute yourself. Then uh, we have uh, uh, G. Sandhya Devi Ji, um, uh, Ina Yadav, Jasmeet Kaur, Jyoti Sayal Ji, Jyoti. Then uh, we have Gera Saab. Uh, then we have uh, Kingshuk Adhikari Ji, Kirti Malik Komal Mehrotra, uh, Kominath Pivi Ji, Manish Semwal, Krishna Veni Ji. Mehar Singh Ji, Mohammad Ajmal, Mukesh Singh, Murshad Ali, Narendra M, Naveen Verma, Neha Bhandari, Nishant Dhankar, Nupur, uh, Parma Shivam, Pradeep Kumar, Pradeep Kumar, Piyush Rivastav Ji, Dr. Poonam Kundu, Pushkar Negi Ji, uh, Rachita Rawat, Rahul Ji, Rajesh Ji, Rakesh Kataria, Ratna Ji, Chef Ritu Uday Kunga Ji, we are delighted to have you here, Chef uh, Ritesh Pathania Ji, Rupali Ji, Sangeeta Ji, Shelja Ji, Shankar Ji, Sharyu Ji, Sabuni Puri. Uh, Shabuni Ji, we are happy that uh, finally you have joined and you are there with us. Uh, Shweta Daya Ji, Siri. Thank you, Shweta Ji. Uh, friends, let me tell you that yesterday's report writing task uh, was done by Shweta and our team of DLC. Uh, Professor Depra, let me apprise you that from the participants, we are picking up volunteers uh, for uh, report writing. So uh, they volunteer themselves and at the end of the day, by 4 when our sessions wind up, so by 4.30 they send us the report, we fine tune it and then finally publish it by acknowledging them. So that's what uh, the participants of this FDP are involved with us. We are happy that Smriti, Sonia Sharma ji, uh, Sushmita ji, then uh, Sumit Rathi ji, uh, Vibhuti Mishra ji, 
uh, Vishal, Rangan, uh, and Vineet, uh, we are happy, delighted that you all are here with us. What a wonderful day, and I'm sure that when the workshop itself is on life skills for blissful life, I must say that we had a blissful yesterday, and I'm sure that the day would be more amazing and blissful with learner Professor Dipra. Uh, friends, let me tell you a brief about Professor Dipra. He's a gem of a person, though formal introduction will be shared by my colleague, uh, Dr. Divya, who is additional director of Center for Life Skills and Soft Skills. But then personally, I know Professor Dipra from a long time and uh, a person par excellence who is into the field of luxury services, hospitality, tourism, and a person who has traveled so many countries across the world. Well, a man of commitments and a man of passion. Uh, he's so passionate about hospitality, tourism, luxury services. And let me tell you that uh, he uh, keeps, uh, continues to help us, mentor us from time to time. Uh, when uh, last year pandemic started, uh, we discussed, and I fondly remember that he was kind enough to share various online tools, tips, and techniques to uh, make classes more effective and interactive. So uh, uh, heartfelt gratitude to Professor Dipra. Thank you, thank you so very much, sir, for uh, joining us. And uh, Dr. Divya, uh, you are here. I request that the number of participants is good, quite good. So uh, we may uh, go ahead with uh, starting of today's session. Sir, in uh, this team of uh, life skills and soft skills faculty development program, with me, I have Dr. Divya Malhan, she is additional director of this center. Then uh, Dr. Nidhi, uh, she is a uh, faculty in management at Center for Professional and uh, Allied Studies of MDU at Gurugram. And she is deputy director of the center with me. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Nidhi. And uh, then we have Mr. Arun Kumar, who is uh, an engineer by profession. He uh, serves as uh, the training and placement officer of uh, our University Institute of Engineering and Technology and uh, uh, an amazing human being and is there as deputy director with me uh, in this Center for Life Skills and Soft Skills. So uh, within a few minutes, uh, Dr. Divya would be joining us. And, uh, Sir, I have joined. I'm there with you. You are most welcome, ma'am. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you here. And uh, over to you. So we welcome uh, Professor Dipra. And uh, for a formal welcome, I request Dr. Divya to formally welcome Professor Dipra. Over to you, Dr. Divya. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for the engagement that you've been doing since morning. In fact, I have joined from a different device, so maybe you could not recognize whether I'm there on board or not. And it's a very nice technique that you used. And this is called soft skills. These are actually skills. So I must say, am I audible to everybody out there? Yeah, yeah, you are okay. very much audible. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. A very good morning. A very, very good morning to all those colorful, beautiful and lovely participants out there whom I can just feel, sense and uh, I cannot see all of you at one go. But definitely I can feel the energy in you because since morning I have been receiving all messages in our chat box. Good morning all, good morning all, good morning all. And this is what is actually the energy of the life skills that we are trying to offer in this FTP to you all. So a very good morning to all of you once again. We offer a very, very uh, warm welcome to our honorable distinguished speaker today. Mr. Dipra Jha, he is a wonderful speaker, as I have come to know from his profile that I have been going through uh, since morning. And uh, I must say, it will take me a lot of time to read out what he actually has been doing. But I must tell you, he is a man who is magnificent. He's a person who is a big personality, and you would be delighted to learn a lot from him today. And I must thank Dr. Ashish. He has been arranging such wonderful personalities for this FDP. It is going to be a landmark. Yesterday, we had a very, very exciting day. We had uh, two very, very dynamic speakers who told us about the various facets of uh, uh, life skills in our lives. And they gave some very good examples from their own lives and which were very motivating. They were very inspiring and we were truly motivated to go ahead in our lives with all those developed skills that we have. 
thank you so much for the yesterday speakers and thank you so much for the patient audience that we had yesterday you all are so beautiful you cooperated so well there have been issues regarding some attendance and we all sorted it out and this is a lovely lovely thing dr ashish is always there for help and uh, dr arun huda dr nidhi they are cooperating so well and the day went so well that this actually is life skills this is the success of the program it talks a lot about it yes uh, lovely to hear some voices in between it definitely gives us some color but uh, i would love that all the participants keep themselves muted because we would love to listen to you at the end of the session when you will be interacting with uh, uh, sir and then uh, of course we will give you some time for the interaction so you can unmute yourselves at that time and right now i will not take much of the time i will introduce our honorable distinguished speaker today Mr Dipraj Ha is a scholarly associate professor in the Carson College of Business and assistant director of the School of Hospitality Business Management at Washington State University in the United States. He is recognized as an expert in luxury hospitality and tourism strategy and he currently serves on the board of directors of Washington Tourism Alliance. A global scholar an innovative educator he is a recipient of the prestigious john wiley and sons innovation in teaching award from the international council on hotel restaurant and institutional education icharie among other honors at wsu professor jha teaches courses in hospitality management and international business he is among a select group of faculty to receive the Samuel H and Patricia W Smith teaching and learning grant to improve undergraduate education professor jha frequently collaborates with communities government entities and private sector organizations in the united states and overseas on training research and outreach projects he has been an invited professor in residence with the venetian palazzo mega resort in las vegas the emirates academy of hospitality management in dubai and the oberoi center of learning and development in india a passionate advocate for experiential learning and global education he is pioneer in using coil that is collaborative online international learning pedagogy in hospitality and business education In 2019 he was conferred a rare and distinguished doctor honoris causa by the KYIV Cooperative Institute of Business and Law in Ukraine for his outstanding contributions to international education. He can be reached on his email which we will give to you at the end of the session. With these words sir I welcome you to this session all those participants out there are eagerly waiting for me to get aside and let you in for the lovely lecture that they are waiting for since morning so over to you sir for your wonderful views welcome sir Good morning everybody um first of all I cannot thank both um uh, Dr Dahia and madam for this wonderful and warm introduction um good morning to all of you i'm presuming almost everybody is joining from india so it is good morning to you it is uh close to 9 pm it's 8:43 pm here in pullman washington because you all are 12 hours and 30 minutes ahead so i had a fabulous dinner i am stocked up on my favorite red soda uh, as you can see so that you know i am in a fabulous mood and when professor dahia asked me i am going to do this session i said of course i mean anything he asks how can i say no to a man who i respect and admire so much i mean he is truly a leader in all things education and i am very honored and humbled to call him my friend so with that i will uh, get started uh, professor dahia um Uh, I'm sure my video and audio feed is clear, correct? Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, folks, what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about effective communication in online and hybrid classrooms. We roughly have um, one hour and forty-five minutes to go because I'm looking at the uh, looking at the clock. So, here is the plan for the day. 
So uh, for, for, for this particular session. So I am going to start off by sharing my experiences in teaching in different cultures. And why is that important? Because uh, teaching or classroom communication is very much informed by the culture that you are teaching in. And I will uh, show you examples of why that matters or how that is important. Then I will talk about the role of culture in classroom communication. And that is universal whether you are teaching face to face in person or you are teaching in an online or hybrid environment. I'm going to talk about a couple of models or theoretical constructs in online and hybrid teaching. And then I'm going to briefly talk about intentional pedagogy. Uh, I, I just do not want this session to be all um, like me talking because it gets very strainful to listen to a speaker for almost two hours. So I will break it up. I have a case study activity. Hopefully we will have time for that. Uh, and where I am going to ask you to take some quiet time and read through the case study, and then we are going to com come back as a large group, and then we're going to talk about what issues or recommendations you have after quickly reading through that case study. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about technology and equipment and how you can build a better virtual presence uh, while you are teaching whether in an online or, an, or, a, or a hybrid mode, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. If we run out of time, I definitely want to respect the, the two hour uh, session limit that has been extended to me. Uh, I want to respect that. So if we run out of time, you are more than welcome to continue the conversation with me via email or other social media such as LinkedIn. Uh, the organizers are going to share my email uh, information, and I have that on, on the very last slide. So you will have an opportunity to write all of that down. So let me start off a little bit by telling you about myself. Uh, we already uh, kind of got to hear during the introduction, but bottom line, um, I work for Washington State University. Um, uh, I am a professor within the Carson College of Business. I actually teach in two areas, um, hospitality business management, and I also teach international business. So I hold appointments in both of these departments. Um, I am the assistant director of the School of Hospitality Business Management. Um, a, a little celebratory uh, announcement, uh, just the new rankings that came out last week, our school is now ranked number two in the United States, and which is a pretty big deal. So my areas sir, of expertise- Sir, please allow me to uh, interrupt you here and ask my all participants of this FTP to switch on their camera for a moment and give a round of applause for this. I think nothing could be more amazing having a professor from a school which is the leading hospitality and tourism school across the globe. Our gratitude to you, sir. It's such a committed team you have and uh, no doubt professors like you and uh, the professors of Washington State University, your school have contributed amazingly well. It's indeed a proud moment. Thank you, sir. Please carry on. Yeah, thank you, Professor Daya. You're, you are, as always, you are very kind. Um, so my areas of expertise are luxury hospitality, as Professor Daya talked about. Um, I also do a lot of work with tourism strategy and, uh, and, and I recently got elected to the board of directors of Washington Tourism Alliance, which is the umbrella organization of all things tourism. Uh, though, you know, I teach in international business or I teach in, um, each in hospitality management, I am very, very, very passionate about undergraduate education. During my introduction, you heard I received the uh, Smith Teaching and Learning Grant to improve undergraduate education. I am constantly asking myself uh, the question, how can I be a better teacher or a better instructor in the classroom? How can I help students to be more successful during their college experience? How can I bridge the gap between the world of practice or the careers they're going to go into versus what they're learning in college? So, uh, as I mentioned, I am uh, uh, very passionate about teaching and learning. And so, in the United States, my, um, you know, I live in the state of Washington, 
And here is the state of Washington where it is located. Um, because when I say Washington, sometimes people get confused because you know there are two Washingtons in in the in the U.S. One is uh, in the East Coast, which is our capital, Washington D.C. Close here, but I live on the West Coast in the Washington State. To our north is Canada. To our west is the Pacific Ocean, and Washington is a spectacularly beautiful state. It is also a very entrepreneurial state. Washington has given the rise to some of the most well-known brands in the world, Amazon, Microsoft, Starbucks, Boeing, all of these are Washington companies. Um, so we are very, very proud as, as the college that I'm part of, Carson College of Business. We have uh, thousands upon thousands of our alumni working in these organizations. So we are very blessed to be part of a state and a part of a business ecosystem, which is so highly supportive uh, of us. So uh, our largest city in the state of Washington is Seattle. Um, it is a spectacularly beautiful city, a uh, lot of tech, um, uh, 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 it's of course a tourism attraction, fantastic seafood and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I live on the opposite side of the state Seattle is on the west side um, on the Pacific Ocean. I live on the opposite side of the state in a, a picture postcard college town called Pullman. This is a picture of Washington State University's campus where my office is. It is located in the rolling Palouse Hills. Uh, Washington State University is the flagship university for the state of Washington. So we have five campuses across the state of Washington. But this is the main campus where I am, um, I, I, I am, I am based at. So as you can see, uh, the background of the rolling Palouse Hills, um, and, and this is a picture of our, of our university campus. It is just beautiful, almost zero pollution, almost zero crime. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, it is truly a picture postcard environment to, uh, to kind, kind, of, um, kind of live in. So I was um, sharing with all of you that how uh, that I, that I am really passionate about teaching and learning, especially undergraduate education. So typically, I enjoy being in the classroom. I enjoy being physically with students, um, engaging with them, uh, learning with them, learning from them, teaching them about the things that I know or the insights I have. And typically, my classroom in the United States will look like this. You know. A lot of group work, a lot of uh, um, lot of kids based learning, and so on and so forth. Um, but I had the opportunity, as Professor Dahia kindly mentioned, to actually be invited all over the world and teach across cultures, like you know, so many different cultures. And every time I am engaging in a different culture, it actually teaches me how to actually engage with that particular audience. So today we're going to be talking about communication, though in an online and hybrid environment, but how you communicate with your students, how you teach is very much informed by the culture that you are in. For example, I was invited by this university in the Ukraine, and here, um, you know, they, their English skills are pretty limited. And I had one of their professors who was translating my lecture. So every couple of minutes, I will speak, and then I will, I will stop, and then she is going to translate for the audience. Very different, the way engaged. If you look at this classroom, it is very different from my classroom here in the United States, where uh, uh, students are sitting around in almost pods. Here it is, this very traditional, long rows of tables. You know, there is a, there is a distance between the instructor or the, or, or the person delivering the lecture and the students, much more stoic. And of course, there is a language barrier. Another great example, I lived in China, uh, in Hainan in 2019, and I taught at Hainan University. So this is the picture from there. Um, China is a very different culture. It's very traditional. Teaching is very traditional. Uh, the professor will stand behind this instructor podium uh, and you see all of these students are smiling because this is the last day, but this was not, not how the semester started. 
uh, there, there is a very high power distance uh, that, you know, that the uh, students rarely ask questions and, and all those kinds of things. Also, the physical environment informs what you can or cannot do. I mentioned the word physical environment. Can anybody pick up something in this classroom that's very unique? In this classroom in China, that's very unique. Is anybody noticing something in this classroom in China that is very unique? You don't see that a lot. So the two tables there, maybe that is creating a physical barrier between the students and the faculty. The two tables that are joined, it's a... Okay. It's like Majority of female students, <laughs> women empowerment maybe. Okay. Sir, but both the lecturer and, sir, both the professor and the students are on the same side. But listen to my question carefully. I said, is there something in the physical or built environment that's very unique? I'm not talking about the people. Is it the CCTV camera? Yes. Every classroom in China has these two giant CCTV cameras on both sides. Everything is being recorded. It's a very different uh, environment to teach. Um, so, wh and what this does, it also sometimes, I mean, students are very hesitant to ask questions because they just don't know that, you know, they know that they are being recorded. So it's, it's a very different kind of an environment and culture compared to my classrooms in America where the whole concept of teaching and learning is critical thinking. That means, you know, here in China, a student would never challenge me if I said something. That's completely opposite in how we teach in the United States. Here in my classroom, it is absolutely okay for a freshman or a first year student, 18 years old, to raise their hand and say, but professor, I do not agree with what you just said. It is absolutely okay for them to say that because that is the fundamentals of critical thinking because we, they are just not passive learners. They are actively engaged in the learning process. So they need to be able to think by, on themselves and then comment. So as you can see these examples, you know, culture informs how or, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of what you teach. Um, same uh, thing when we are looking at, um, if I may, Professor Daya, can, can the, can the co-host mute everybody else except for myself? Vijayji, please unmute everyone except the speaker. Mrs. Uh, Smita Mankar, can you please unmute yourself? Mute herself. Mrs. Smita Mankar, please mute yourself. Sir, sir, go I'm ahead. sorry for okay, this. Perfect. Uh, so I just saw a chat comment from Dr. Sonia Sharma that in India, all classrooms are equipped with cameras. Even in universities, you have cameras in all classrooms recording everything that students and professors are saying. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, audio as well as video. So uh, almost in our university, it is well equipped. We are using very high tech, you know, cameras to listen. And even when whatever we are teaching, our seniors they are listening it very carefully and weekly they are giving us feedback for the thing. And so now, not only in university, but in some of the colleges are also equipped with CCTV cameras now. Interesting. Uh, interesting. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I, I, I probably, um, you know, your students and faculty are, uh, first of all, these kinds of things are unthinkable in Western Europe or say uh, US because of privacy and all of the other reasons. So, so, so that means, you know, things in India are changing as well. I am actually seeing lots of people saying no um, to, 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 the, to the cameras. Um, so it seems like probably private colleges or private institutions are instituting this. Are there examples of any government or public institutions using ca physical cameras and recording everything in the classroom in India? I'm talking about public or government universities or colleges. 
Yes, so, sir. Our uh, government college also has to install cameras. Some classrooms we have cameras. Let me put put it this way. Know, it's, it is not in all classrooms. What we have tried to do, we have created one or two as a model classroom. So I think almost every government institution now has one or two such model classroom where you have all these digital tools, and they are available, but not in all the classrooms. Just to clarify, Professor Daya, this is not a distant tool. This is not for distant teaching. This is for physical, like, you know, these, the classroom in China, it is not equipped for distance learning. It is every physical interaction between students and faculty, the camera is running. No, no, sir, our purpose is different. Our purpose is different. We have just one or two for the purpose that we can go for uh, any distinguished speaker if he's here and if he intends yeah. to use tools or maybe online for regular students. But the purpose is very different from China. Right. Yeah. So that, that, that I wanted to clarify so, that in, in, in this case, you know, any and, and these classrooms are not set up. So sorry, somebody else had a uh, had a comment. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. Uh, so as you can see that the culture informs, you know, how, 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 how you teach. Like, you know, I was doing this presentation in Breda University in the Netherlands. You know, it is a converted, uh, their, their campus is converted from an old monastery. And this is the chapel is the main auditorium. As you can see the organ in the back. I am so far away from the audience that it is very hard um, to even make an eye contact, you know, in the audience. So when you are teaching in this kind of an environment, it is very different. Here I am in Thailand at the National Institute of Development Administration, you know, very different. Thailand, just very much like India, is a very warm, friendly culture. Um, uh, and, and so the students there are uh, much more engaged, much more happy, and, and so on and so forth, compared to this is Corvinus University in Budapest, Hungary, which is considered the Harvard of, uh, of Hungary. You know, there, this is, uh, this is kind of Central Eastern Europe, much more stoic, people are much more quieter, um, they listen much more carefully, and then so on and so forth. And, and then uh, the final uh, picture is from uh, the, a Guru series lecture I did in Shulini University in, in India. This is in Solan in Himachal Pradesh. Um, so my point in showing you all of these pictures is that that as you can see, depending on the physical space and the culture that, that you know, we are teaching in, our communication strategies change. And we are gonna talk a little bit when I specifically introduce the models of culture. But as much as I enjoy you know, doing all of this physical in-classroom teaching, um, as was mentioned during the introduction, I have been experimenting with technology and able teaching for a long time now for many, many years, way before COVID-19 happened and all of that. Um, for example, in 2017, I received a grant from the United States Department of State to start the Global Virtual Classroom Project. At that time, I was at the University of Nebraska and my 8 a.m. class in Nebraska actually live joined with students in Dubai and Oman together. This was way before you know, Zoom, Zoom was even a thing. I mean, I was one of the first professors to adopt Zoom for teaching. At that time, Zoom did not even have a virtual background. Um, so now uh, through all of this stuff, you know, we have gotten so used to Google Meet and WebEx and all these kinds of things. So as you can see, and the technology here I'm holding in my hand, this is called catch box throwable microphones because in a large classroom, you need to capture very clear audio. So, the, so these, uh, uh, these mi microphones have a very specialized technology. So if I ask a question to a student, I can throw this microphone to them. When the microphone is actually traveling through the air, it automatically shuts off. As soon as the student catches it, it turns back on so that we can have very clear audio uh, for Zoom or WebEx or whatever as we are recording. And as you can see, my teaching assistant here is sitting. She's controlling this classroom actually has multiple cameras. So we have multiple you know, digital display, one large display in the front that I'm looking at, one large display in the back. So you know, this is 2017, way before uh, it, uh, you know, virtual learning and all of these things 
became mainstream. So I was kind of experimenting with that. Um, other things I have experimented with, for example, I have used a telepresence robot in my classroom. What a telepresence robot does is that, you know, this robot can actually move around in the classroom. So if I were to say an example, if I were to invite Professor Dahia to actually do a guest lecture in my class here at Washington State University, and it is a smaller class, I can bring him in virtually using this telepresence robot. And this is so cool that I can give the control of the robot to Professor Dahiya sitting in Rotak, India. He can actually drive the robot in my classroom in Washington and go right up to a student and ask them a question. What do you guys think about this technology? What do you guys think about this technology? Of of that's, that's simply amazing, sir, and rather I'm excited to come sometime virtually there. <laughs> <laughs> and and drive the robot, right? Uh, true, 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 very yeah. true, very true. How cool it is that you know you can be sitting in your living room and then and driving a robot in Washington and talking to students. Uh, so so once again, I'm just saying that you know teaching and learning is changing as at a breakneck speed, um, and I always like to look at what is coming next, how we can improve um, delivery how we can improve uh, content and, and, and so on and so forth. But, le but, but let me be very, very clear. These kinds of technologies needs a lot of resources, not only at the front end, but also at the back end. You need to have very good IT people, you know, who knows how to actually integrate this with your whatever software classroom system and all of that kind of stuff. And let me also tell you, that you know sometimes once again this is four years ago um you know i'm showing you a picture from and now the third version of the same robot has been released and i'm now working with the company double robotics to look at you know if we can uh, how we can incorporate that in some of some of the teaching that i do here at washington state my point in all of this is that that the world of teaching and learning is changing very quickly and to be effective instructors you need to understand and you need to prepare yourself to switch between whether fully 100% in person, where there is no camera, you are just teaching with a blackboard and chalk or something absolutely like the Star Wars or Star Trek, where you actually have a telepresence robot to you know, uh, bring, bring a guest speaker in. So once again, when, I, when I'm talking about the influence of culture and technology in teaching and learning, in an online hybrid environment. This picture is a great example of hybrid. We are still meeting in a physical classroom, but we are using very, very cutting edge technology to bring a guest speaker in. And as a matter of fact, some of my students were like kind of scared. They were uncomfortable with this level of technology. Uh, they just thought this was way too much. It was almost kind of invading. This technology was invading in their private space because they were just not looking at a monitor on a wall. Here, the robot is coming right up to them and asking their, their, their names, like, you know, uh, like, you know, what's your name, Kristen? My name is so and so, and, and you, you, you talk like that. And taking it to a fully virtual medium, you know, one of the things that I have uh, started to do, for example, I do these kinds of speaking engagements around the world, like, Sometimes it is too much. Like this week is one of those. Uh, I actually did a two hour presentation last night. Um, so it's basically Monday morning for you um, at, uh, at, at Manipal, at the Welcome to Graduate School in Manipal. I am doing this today. And then again, Wednesday, I have another two hour uh, presentation um, in, in, in Asia. So since I do all of these kinds of stuff, I have been asking myself, how can I humanize or make this more personable, my, my presence more personable, my you know, make it more pleasant. So uh, I showed you a picture of that, you know, I do a lot of work with universities in the Ukraine. So not too long ago, I was actually doing a faculty development program for one of the top universities in Ukraine. We had scholars from everywhere. And for that, I actually used this background, this virtual background, this is a real picture of the capital of Ukraine, Kiev. When I was there, I took this picture 
And actually this bow tie that I'm wearing, it is Ukrainian design and Ukrainian friend of mine gifted this to me. So I thought this will be a great way to actually come across and also pay homage or honor their culture. So as soon as I came on Zoom and they saw this virtual background, people from Ukraine started talking to me saying that, oh, you have been to our country and all of that. I see you are wearing an Ukrainian bow tie, designed bow tie and all those kinds of things. So the point I am making is that, that virtual teaching and learning can be very, very engaging and how you are communicating yourself just by the picture or your presence is also very important because that sets the tone. Content and all of these things will come later. But the question is, how are you presenting yourself even in a fully virtual environment like, I, uh, like, like this picture that, uh, that I'm showing now? So we have been talking for almost uh, 40 minutes now. I want to just you know, take, a, uh, take a moment and ask this question to all of you in the audience. I know you have, um, you, you have research scholars and some postgraduate students, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have full professors in the audience with uh, years and years and incredible teaching experience, and we have everybody in between. So let me pose a question that what are some of the challenges you are facing in online or hybrid teaching? I know we have now, almost everybody has been doing it for one and a half years now because you know everything shut down in February, March in 2020 and you guys are still going. So uh, I see one common bandwidth problem with the student side, absolutely. Online classes sometimes feels boring. Very good, very good. Uh, yes, to that, of course, you know, there is research clearly says that you should not be doing online classes for like sessions for more than 45 minutes. After that, it is very hard to pay. Personal touch is missing there. Connectivity issues. It is difficult to engage students. Very, very, very important. Um, connectivity issues are coming up a uh, lot of times. Yes, uh, online virtual teaching uh, is very taxing for eyes. Oh, Dr. Reshmi, I, I mean, yeah, there are days that after two or three Zoom meetings or classes, I go actually take a, you know, take a nap on my couch because my head hurts. I get so tired. Um, there is less of interactive energy. Yes, and, 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 and interaction is something that you, know, you need to, uh, we're gonna talk about intentional pedagogy. Face-to-face -face interaction can't be replaced by virtual interaction. Uh, yes, it can be, but there are ways to actually even engage people. Uh, difficult to maintain student interest, tracking the students totally missing, very few students open their video camera. We have to make it, okay. Sometimes one-way communication, absolutely. That's why engagement, that's why, I mean, that's the reason I am stopping here and letting you respond, you know? Uh, the feel is missing. Yes, I mean, most of us became uh, professors or teachers or instructors because we enjoy being in, in the classroom. Uh, so so the, the idea is that, yes, virtual teaching, online or hybrid teaching is not going to fully uh, replace um, uh, you know, replace the, the teaching and learning enterprise, but it is here, it is definitely here to stay. So, so let's look at um, this report that just came out from LinkedIn News. This is of May, uh, you know, this May. So look at that. The remote share of, the, of this work from May 2020 and one year rate increase. So as you can see that, you know, media and communications from 2.8%, it jumped remote share of this work jumped to 26.8%. But look at education from 2.6%, this 2.6% were people like me in 2017 doing that kind of global virtual stuff. Now it is 12.6%. So, and actually in March, I attended a very intense three-day teaching workshop at Harvard Business School, and it was incredible. One thing is for certain, online and hybrid learning is here to stay. So, so yes, 
we all feel nostalgic. We all feel that we, if we could just go back to the physical classroom and keep doing what we did for our entire lives, everything is going to be okay. However, that is not going to be the case. You know, it doesn't, and it doesn't matter that, you know, where you are, whether you are in the United States or in India or in China or Ukraine or Hungary or wherever, what is happening is the pandemic is a black swan event. Black swan is a term that is used by the financial industry to basically um, uh, describe an event where there were no precedent. That means, you know, it has never happened before. We don't know how to, how to read it or how to interpret it. So any, whenever a black swan event hap happens, there are a lot of paradigm shifts in society. The COVID-19 is a black swan event. And, and we are seeing the same kinds of things in a sense that there is this tremendous amount of changes that is happening you know, in the education segment. So, you know, I mean, education, high, especially higher education is very traditional and very conservative. Universities do not like change. That's why they're usually around for 200, 300, 400, 800 years, because they're usually there to preserve themselves, tradition, culture, all of that kind of stuff. But you know, if that segment is changing uh, by a factor of almost five times, it says something. So my point in actually you know, showing this slide to all of you is that make no mistake, online and hybrid learning is here to stay. So irrespective of whether you are a postgraduate student or a research scholar, or a very, very accomplished and experienced faculty member, um, it, will be, it, it will be good for all of us to become what I call mixed methods teachers. That means that yes, I am very good at in-person uh, classroom teaching, but I also need to learn how to be an engaging teacher in online and hybrid classrooms. And this, is, this ties right into this World Economic Forum skilled students need to be successful. At the end of the day, what are we teaching students for? We are teaching students for that not only they are going to know, they are going to come out with knowledge, whatever they are learning, whether it is um, uh, in organic chemistry or, 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 or aeronautical engineering or hospitality or whatever, we want them to be equipped with those skills so that when they graduate, they will be able to use those skills to be successful professionals in whatever they do, whether they are going to teach English in a high school or they are going to go work for um, NASA and build rockets. Everybody needs to develop those skills. And what are those skills uh, that students will need? Um, the World Economic Forum is forecasting, anal analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking, and the reason I'm showing you all of this is, as you can see, content is taking a back seat. That means that this old model of teaching where what we call sage on a stage, a professor standing behind a podium and showing PowerPoints and lecturing for 45 minutes. That is, I mean, there is really no need for that anymore because with technology, you can actually put that you know, uh, on a YouTube video or all of that kind of stuff. Like um, I, um, I, I actually uh, use a, a, a lot of lot, lot of things uh, that um, that what I call a flipped classroom model, and it is it is always very 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 in, uh, in, interesting to be uh, to be able to use that. I don't know why my annotation suddenly popped up. So okay. So, and, and why is this important? Because, you know, once again, I just talked about Amazon is a Washington company. You know, they are one of the largest corporations in the world. They're also one of the most innovative companies. Thousands and thousands of young students, at least in the United States, you know, line up to work for Amazon because they are at the cutting edge of innovation, very similar to Google or, or, or Facebook or Microsoft. They just announced a new hiring process. What they said is that, that if you want a job with Amazon, of course, in a certain role, like, you know, say you want an engineering job with Amazon, 
you just apply once and then you have to interview via video conferencing. They are not going to interview face to face. If you are successful in the interview, then you can basically pick any role within that domain. So you can pick what kind of engineer you want to be in Amazon. But as you can see that, you know, this is a very different model of human resources attracting talent compared to what was before, where a company's advertised for one position, they got applications, and then, you know, they, they found the best candidate. Once again, and also you will notice that, that you know, human resource processes are changing. Companies, at least I can tell you in the United States, are not going to bring people on board for interview in person. As a matter of fact, last year, when, you know, I was going through my interview process with Washington State University, the pandemic happened. So my entire, entire interview process happened on Zoom. I have not set foot. I mean, they even sent my plane ticket last year, 2020 March, to come visit campus because I was the finalist candidate for this position. So it is even remarkable that very traditional organizations like our top research university in America is hiring a senior administrator on Zoom. So it is very, very interesting that as an as a, as a, as a instructor or as a teacher, as an educator, that you also need to prepare students for the future that is coming where you, know, you may love to teach in person in the classroom and your student may be very good at interviewing face to face, but they will probably not get an opportunity to interview face to face with, a, with an employer. So can they command this little space? As you can see that this little space is just this box and you are just seeing my head and half of my torso and a, black, black, a blurred background. So, but, but, you know, so helping students learn and kind of negotiate all of that has become extremely important. Um, blending approach, yes. Let me stop here and see if there are any questions, thoughts or comments about what we talked about so far. We have been talking for 51 minutes now. So anybody has any thoughts, comments, anything I said, anything that you, uh, think is agreeable or you completely disagree, that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. Thank you, Ms. Navneet. Thank you, Komal. Okay, very good. So, so let, let, let me shift gears a little bit and start talking about role of culture in classroom communication. Now, folks, I, I showed you pictures of me traveling the world, teaching in physical classroom. Now let's take, take a deeper dive into why culture is important. So because I want to start with this famous quote by Paul Wadzlawick, you cannot not communicate. Let me repeat, you cannot not communicate. That means if you are shutting your camera off during the entire semester, and you are, and if your student is not communicating with you even for once, they are still communicating. They are saying that I am really not engaged. I am really not interested. So that means you cannot not communicate. You know, it is very important to understand that. More important to understand this because when you are operating in an online, virtual, or a hybrid environment, that whatever you do, you know, as soon as you come onto the class and you know you switch on your camera as an instructor or a teacher you are communicating something like one of the things i like to do i like to you know log on a few minutes before class every day uh, on zoom because we use zoom uh, like most american universities do and i just do chit chat hey how is it going like you know or i saw some social media post by by a student that they won an award or they did something interesting that draws them in they, then they also feel a connect. One of the things many of you commented in the chat is that the, the inability to create some kind of a rapport. Now, once again, I am going to talk about that in a minute because it is also informed by culture. Now, there are two types of cultures. Some of you who have taken classes in sociology um, or, 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 or those kinds of areas or even human resources may already be familiar with this model that was developed by Hall, 
that basically we can divide um, the world into two types of culture, low context and high context. Why does that matter? Because low context culture like the United States, North America is very individualistic. It is all about I and me, my space, my respect and all of that. Low context cultures are also very task oriented. That means tell me what needs to be done, let's get it done and let's get up with it. And then communication is much more direct. High context culture like India is much more collectivist, is we, family, all of those things are important. You are just not an individual, you are a part of a family and of society at large. It is much more relationship oriented, it is not task oriented. And communication is much more nuanced. A person in India, let me give you a specific example. Like, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends who are from the Netherlands, they're Dutch, you know. Dutch people or German people, they're they are extremely low context, you know, not only highly individualistic, but their communication is very direct. So for example, you know, if you went to a barber and got a haircut, you know, and then you have a Dutch friend and you ask them, hey, how does my haircut look? If, if, if your German or Dutch friend think that you look ugly, you know, that your haircut do, does not look good at all, they will say, your haircut looks ugly. This is something that normally never someone in India will say to their friend. They will nuance it even if they do not like it because there the society is much more relationship based. I do not want to disrespect or ruin my relationship with you. Compared to if you ask a Dutch or a German person they, where they come from in a task oriented society is that you know, if you are asking me, that means you value my opinion. That means it, 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 is, it is incumbent upon me to give my honest opinion, not to make you feel good. And so that's the reason I said in my, in my like HBM 280, which is an introduction level class in a hospitality systems class, it, sometimes we will have this robust debate. And I like it because, you know, I like when a first year freshman student will actually raise their hand and challenge me that, about something I said, and we are going to have a robust dialogue because, you know, we are teaching them the most important thing is critical thinking because at a top business school in America, we don't want yes people because we are trying to produce the best business leaders. They need to be very, very articulate, you know, in the process of decision making. So as you can see, depending on which culture you are operating in, that, you know, your communication style is going to be, uh, going to be changing. You know, here in the United States, it is a task oriented society. Communication is very direct compared to many, many other societies where it is not. Even within Europe, I talked about Germany, opposite is Spain. Spanish people are much more easygoing. They're much more relationship oriented. One of the things I see a lot in terms of like, you know, since we're talking about teaching and learning, how this plays out is in the concept of time. High context cultures, you all uh, know this very well because you are tuning in from India. In a, in a culture like India, time, is a more flexible uh, uh, kind of a concept, you know, in a sense. So if somebody invites you for dinner, you ask them, what time do you want me to come? If they say, hey, maybe around 8, 8.30, you know, 8, 8, 8.30 means that it could be anything between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. However, in low context cultures, that is not acceptable. Time is highly organized. In the United States, the saying is, five minutes early is on time, on time is late. For example, if you come to our university, you will see that if there is a meeting at 10 a.m. in the morning, everybody is in the meeting room at 9.55. The meeting starts dot at 10 o'clock. If you walk in at 10 o'clock, you are already late. And that is same for Zoom meeting or whatever, and stuff like that. That's the culture. The worst thing that you can do to a person in North America, like in the US or a Canada, is just show up late without informing them. It is considered extremely rude and insulting to be late in this culture. I see that a lot for students who come from high context cultures, say India, 
or Vietnam or so on and so forth who are not used to the American culture that they will show up for class late. And students, uh, the local students get very irritated that, you know, if my class starts at eight o'clock, somebody just walks in at seven minutes past eight, it is just not done. Because in this culture, it is a high, remember, in a low context culture, it is about individualism. So when show, somebody shows up seven minutes after class has started, opens the door, disturbs the professor, disturbs the students, for, the, for a local student or somebody who is raised in the American culture, the, the, uh, the, uh, the emotion is, who has given you the right to disrupt my learning? Because I am paying $40,000 a year to go to school at Washington State University. Nobody has given another person the right. So it is a very different concept of time in a, uh, 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 you know, in low context and high context cultures and in online and hybrid teaching, especially if you are going to do intercultural teaching. Like for example, if you, know, you get an invitation, especially from a, a, a low context culture to deliver a, a, a lecture, a presentation or something like that, it might be, it, 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 I would recommend, I mean, it would be wise to actually log in 10 minutes before, do your technology check, and make sure that you are good to go right on time. So, you know, so the concept of time is very important. Classroom communication. In low context cultures, US, Canada, Germany, Netherlands, it is overt and explicit, simple and clear. Be succinct, like, you know, my professor, Dr. Ron Stamen used to say, do not bloviate, be succinct. Say what you have to say, you know, directly, Precisely, you know, choose your words carefully. Don't keep like blabbering. Focus is on verbal communication. In North America, if you are talking to somebody and you are not making eye contact, it is considered very rude. That means you are really not interested in that person, which is exact opposite in many high context cultures where you avoid eye contact based on rank and hierarchy. Many times you, you know, young students will not look into the eyes of their, if they're talking to a senior administrator or a professor. Small talk. Yes, we also have small talk in the United States, but it is just right at the top of the meeting, beginning of the meeting. Uh, how is everybody? What happened this weekend? Uh, but, but remember, that is not an invitation to unload your life story. You know, it is just to be brief, just say, you know, oh, I had great, I had a, had a great dinner at a restaurant, stuff like that. Also, it does not involve personal information. Uh, so, and that's the reason, you know, uh, these things, these cultural contexts in classroom communication are very, very, very important. Um, in high context cultures, you know, uh, communication is covert and implicit, a lot of metaphors, reading between the lines, do you understand, you know, uh, the cultural context and nuances. Nonverbal communication is also very, yeah, very, very important. So classroom communication, you know, depending on what kind of culture, you know, you're teaching in, or now with the pandemic, a lot of people are doing cross-cultural stuff. It is very important to remember that, that, you know, your, your, your home culture or your national culture may be very different from when you're engaging with other cultures, and you may offend people not even knowing what, um, what, what, what you are doing. For example, in my global virtual classroom, every time, you know, the students from Oman came onto the screen because we were all meeting together. My American students were completely taken aback. Now, what do you see in this picture? From a cultural perspective, folks, what do you see in this picture? How will it be very different from an American classroom or even an Indian classroom? Sir, I think all males are sitting in the first row and the females in the later rows. Absolutely, Professor Daya. See, this is a great understanding of culture. This is a very traditional conservative society. The men will sit in the front, the women all wearing black abayas sit in the back. They do not mingle, though they are in the same classroom. This is not like Saudi Arabia where they can't be even in the same classroom. You know, so I travel the world. So when I'm engaging, but this is actually because I teach classes in international business and we, I often use a Peter Drucker's famous quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you do not understand culture, 
you will not be able to do business in that culture or in that country, you know? So, so this is a great example of the, you know, if you are going to be teaching in a culture like this, you need to understand where they're coming from. When I travel in the Middle East, you know, I will never shake hands with a person of opposite gender. Like, you know, I will never extend my hands to shake hands um, uh, with, a, with a female executive and so on and so forth. Unless, of course, you know, places like Dubai and all, they're much more progressive. You know, many women have been uh, trained or educated in the West. They sometimes will extend their hand to shake hands. That's fine. But this is a great example of, I'm giving you an example of a physical classroom, but which is joining us virtually. But looking at this classroom, it kind of gives you a sense that how culture is so important. And actually, once we finish class, I actually have a debrief with my students because they have lots of questions. American students have lots of questions. Like, you know, why do they sit like that? Why are all the men wearing white? Why are all the women wearing black? Yeah, these things are, of course, culturally nuanced. And you need to, uh, you need to understand that. I am sure, even in India, um, you know, a classroom in a place like Delhi is probably um, very different, or, or Bengaluru, it probably looks slightly different from, I'm saying, a small town. I don't know what, what the example would be. Or, I, I mean, do you think there are those differences, or is it more homogeneous? Anybody has any comment? My question is, are classrooms in large metropolitan cities in India look the very same in, say, a small, I would say, rural community or not? Any comments? No, sir. I see some people saying yes. Would 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 anybody like to you know uh, comment on audio? Uh, like Dr. Deepya Malhan says, there's a big difference. Would you like to comment, comment, madam, like on audio? Um, what do you mean by that? Because these these discussions are very important. Okay, I'm seeing uh, no, yes. Okay. Um, so, hello, sir. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Please. Uh, sir, this is Shankar Kumar Mukherjee. I am uh, I'm a Bengali and I have visited rural Bengal. And in rural Bengal, I have seen in a classroom, in a school classroom, the boys are sitting in a row and the girls are sitting in a row. And when the recess happens, the girls leave fast and then the boys leave. So that is the custom uh, that in uh, most of the schools in rural Bengal, they do follow. That's a great comment. You know, that's a great comment. So that means, you know, depending on what microculture, you know, yeah. India is a very vast country with so many states um, and, and, and different. Can I say um, something, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, actually, what we feel is that there is a lot of difference between the metropolitan cities' classrooms and village classrooms. In village, uh, there is a lot of conservatism still going on, and you will find fewer girls studying, more of boys there, where in metropolitan cities, you will find that there is a lot of girls who have come up to study, and uh, the boys would be equal in number or maybe even less sometimes. So this is one thing, sir. Secondly, uh, what we have uh, found is, um, is my voice audible, sir? Yes, there's a little echo. I don't know why, but yeah, okay. we can hear you. Yes. Okay. And uh, sir, we can also uh, see that uh, in the village classrooms, uh, definitely what sir has just told that uh, the girls and the boys, they always sit apart. There is a one row which is for the girls, one row which is for boys. Whereas in metropolitan cities, you can see that even on one bench, there is one boy sitting, one girl sitting and they are uh, like interacting very closely with the teachers. In the villages, we find that the students do not uh, easily interact with the teachers. There is a power distance. They feel very hesitant to interact. Whereas in cities, you will find that the students are a little opened up and they interact very frequently with the teachers, especially when I'm considering India as uh, the example. So these are some of the differences that we observe, sir. Oh, that's, that's such a wonderful comment, Dr. Diva. Thank you so much. And sir, so I, so I do good. wish to add up sir? something, sir. Can I, well, can I add a few, few points, sir? Can I? Add? I think uh, is Professor Daya wanted to go first, and that, then that is the case. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. Sir. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Kartikeyan, go ahead. 
Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, that is the case with uh, Tamil Nadu also, sir. Uh, recently, we have a detailed discussion, sir, that's going on in the social media, whether we have whether we should have uh, co-education schools, because a lot of uh, complaints about harassment. So there was a healthy discussion going on uh, whether to have co-ed education system. Why, 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 why should not we go for a separate education, male for separate schools for male and female? And that's going on, sir. So as far as culture is concerned, you know, sir, uh, this uh, topic is a uh, hot topic you now that we have to deliberate, sir. What do you think about this one, sir, actually? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Kartikian. Uh, if you ask me, my short answer to that is I think, um, you know, it is important to actually build a healthy relationship between boys and girls um, uh, and at different kinds of students since they are children. Um, I mean, I, in my humble opinion, I just think it is regressive to actually, you know, bring children up separately as if there is some kind of an antagonism between these two genders. But, but you know, I am not an expert in school level education. So this is just my very uninformed opinion. Uh, but that's, that's, my, that's my thought. I, I, have, Thank you, I am not a researcher um, in, that, in, in that area. Somebody else had a comment. I, I wanted you, to share something, sir. First, we welcome uh, Mr. Rajbir Deswal, sir. Uh, he has been really kind. Uh, when we apprised him that uh, you are coming, he uh, uh, has been so kind that he joined our session. Uh, welcome, uh, sir. Our gratitude to you. Number two, uh, sir, I wish to share that in India, we have a lot of diversity. And uh, so you can see... Uh, different schools and different higher education institutes in the country. So there are institutes which are very uh, technically uh, savvy. There are institutes or universities where they allow uh, amalgamation of cultures and people mix up. Whereas keeping a view uh, a respect to the host population or regional uh, aspects, there are states where there are exclusive women universities. So only females can study and means cannot. Even the higher positions there as vice chancellor or registrar are uh, exclusively for women. So with such diversity, uh, there, there is a unique kind of ecosystem that we have. And yes, the topic which you have raised in connect to cross-cultural communication and understanding these aspects is very, very important. So that, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. You know, it, is, it is not about, you know, uh, gender-based education or anything like that, as, as Professor Daya flagged it rightly. We are, and, and yes, there are micro, um, micro systems within. Yes, I mean, uh, a, a country or a culture like India, there is, there is no one in a sense that there is rural versus metropolitan, state to state, and, and yes, I mean, uh, I'm sure because there are those dedicated women's colleges or universities, actually, families feel safe to send their girls there, you know? I mean, so, so I'm just saying that sometimes when we have these discussions, a lot of my you know, thinking is informed by the North American experience, which is not the correct experience to apply to a country like India, because, you know, like I said, these are completely two different systems. So, uh, I mean, what works here? I mean, compared to like more egalitarian societies, like say, uh, the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, you know? Uh, they're extremely much more egalitarian. It's a much more different kind of society. So I think those conversations are, these are great conversations we're having. I think probably Professor Daya can organize a completely different uh, <laughs> you know, session with leading experts who know something about it. I don't, you know, um, uh, to, to, uh, to do this. So let's- So there's let's, a small, uh, small, yeah, uh, small suggestion, Please. small addition to it. The discussion is in, has been going on. And uh, what I find is that women universities or schools or colleges are being advocated because uh, of the law and order situations also. So it's not only in connect with our mindset of teaching uh, students differently, like boys uh, uh, in a different school and girls in a different school. Sometimes if we look at the law and order situation, if it improves, I think parents would be motivated to go for the co-education -edu system. Sir. Well, sir, in connect to what Dr. Divya has stated, I'd like to add on something here. Uh, law and order can be one perspective, but I think it's more about uh, cultural or a social fabric. 
so uh, many a times it is maybe that a mother is willing to send her daughter to a co-ed school but the place where she is dwelling or she is living in the social fabric makes her feel more secure that they are going to uh, girls college or girls school so at times that is also a reason uh, or at times say for example i studied in a school in my district for the reason that it was a good school that that's indeed a good reason but then there was a legacy my father studied in that school so he was keen that i should also go to that school so there are several reasons to it but then yes such kind of debates what you have rightly uh, taken up leads to opening up and igniting of minds and coming up with new ideas and thoughts thank you sir let's uh, let's move on to uh, you uh, i'll mute myself sure uh now, since, you know, we, I'm, I'm really enjoying this discussion. I mean, I can see that, you know, as participants, you are engaging, you are applying your minds and, and, and all, all, of, all of these kinds of things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about theoretical constructs in online and hybrid teaching. I am going to talk about a couple of models. Uh, we have very experienced people in this audience. They may already know this stuff, but I think it will be helpful for all of, all of us. Uh, is it my voice breaking too much? No, no, sir. That may, must be a network problem at the participant level. Uh, you okay. are very much audible. Okay. Uh, so, so let's look at some of the theoretical constructs in online and hybrid teaching. The one that I actually use a lot in my work or my teaching is Bloom's taxonomy. Um, many of you may already uh, be familiar with this model or have done work with this model or learned, uh, learned about it. Uh, that uh, that what happens in Bloom's taxonomy is that we have to first, you know, build the base for our students, and then we have to take them through this process of uh, when we talk about teaching or even assessment or what they are learning is uh, whether they are remembering, then understanding, application, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Uh, how this works is that that you know when you are starting, say your freshman or first year students, when you are actually designing the curriculum or coursework, you are basically teaching them the basics of like, that's the reason we use exams, like, you know, we use test, multiple choice test questions, what the capital of India, and then you give them whatever, four, um, four options to choose from. You are basically just testing their knowledge, but after knowledge, you have to build the comprehension, and that's how Bloom's taxonomy works. So as they are going through the three-year or the four-year program at the college or university, the goal of that entire program or curriculum is to actually move them from knowledge to the evaluation. And, and, and how do you move them? Say, for example, um, I teach a, a class in leadership uh, for all of our senior, senior means fourth year or final year students, you know? In that leadership class, not only they have to actually create a leadership project, but they actually have to teach each other, like they are actually doing presentations. Presentations are extremely important aspects on my classes because I want our students to be getting good at public speaking. Once again, going back to being sucks, uh, you know, uh, being succinct and, and, and being very precise and so on and so forth. That means, you know, at each stage, you need to design not only your content or curriculum, but also all your assessment instruments, moving the students from, uh, from, the, from the, what we call the lower level of learning to a higher level of learning. You know, whatever they are uh, learning, can they analyze? Like when I talk about a case study analysis, case study analysis is a combination of analysis and synthesis, like the things that they have learned. Like right now, I am teaching an international tourism class fully online. You know, it's a six week summer class. And the final project they're doing is the United Nations World Tourism Organization report on women in tourism. They are now actually analyzing that report as a final project. And then they are basically referring uh, to all of the readings they have done in the articles and in the textbook and synthesizing why is that, you know, uh, why is that report important? Um, you know, why we need to actually pay attention to those kinds of issues and so on and so forth. So this is Bloom's taxonomy. 
The other model that I like to use a lot is was developed by uh, Russian educationist Lev Vygotsky, which is called the zone of proximal development. So I know I'm getting a little technical here, uh, but, but you know, one of the things is that I would, if you are not familiar with these models, I would ask you to actually research them after this FDP is over. And this might be really helpful for you in understanding how you can improve your own teaching or even, even your curriculum design. Um, so in zone of proximal development, what Vygotsky is saying is that, you know, what's the current understanding of students? So if you are going to teach, I'll take a random example. Now, let's say if you are teaching accounting, you want to teach your students balance sheet. But before you can students balance sheet, uh, teach balance sheet, do they understand the basic definitions of debit and credit and cash flow? You know, because if they do not know the basic um, tenets of accounting, there is no point, you know, trying to teach them balance sheet. How do you do that? You know, you start at the beginning of the semester, like the tools I employ, um, especially in lower level classes, I will do give them what is called a pretest, you know, at the beginning of the semester. And pretest does not have to be a formal exam. You can just spend time asking them, okay, what have you learned so far? Or, you know, tell us what is debit, what is credit, or, or, or all of those kinds of things. What is their current understanding? And then you know what you need to scaffold. Scaffolding is a cognitive psychology term. Scaffolding means you are helping students. So if your goal is to teach balance sheet, uh, you know, you have to make sure that you know what is their current level of understanding. Do they know basic accounting principles? Because if they don't know that, they will never be able to understand balance sheet. And then if you find out that there is some deficiencies, that you know, there is some remedial that you have to do, then you actually scaffold that. Maybe you revisit some of those accounting concepts and that helps them to scaffold up to when you can start teaching about balance sheet. I just give you an example like that. The problem is if you don't do that, for example, your, your course, your class, your curriculum says you have to teach X, Y, Z here. You know, but then your students don't know, they don't even know that. So how are they, they don't even know the basics, how are they going to bridge this gap? So that's where zone of proximal development kind of, uh, kind of comes into the, in, into the play. Uh, and then how do you develop a strategy for, uh, for, for engaged teaching? Of course, the first thing is intentional pedagogy. Intentional pedagogy means active learning, that is, which is inclusive, which is very, very engaging. And th that's why you, know, you are designing your entire curriculum based on what is the level of the student. You are continuously asking these two questions, which level of Bloom's taxonomy you know, am I teaching at, where my students are, and what are my, what's the current understanding of my students? What is it, what's my curriculum objective? How can I bridge the gap? Does this make sense, folks? Is this making sense? I know I'm getting a too technical here, with a little model, but it's very interesting. Right. We're learning a lot. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, so once again, I mean, these these things are publicly available resources. You can actually research them, and and then you know, I would encourage you to basically start using them in your, um, you know, in a, in, in your teaching strategies. Um, mixed method instruction. I I told you at the beginning of the of the session that it is very important. Online, hybrid, virtual is here to stay. It is not going to go away. It is only going to increase. So if you, if you are interested in being a really good teacher, an effective teacher, then it is important that you, know, you actually learn not only in person, but also online synchronous versus asynchronous, also hybrid combination of in-person online and what we call high flex, which is simultaneous in-person and virtual. Another very big uh, thing is instructional feedback. How do I know that I am doing a decent job as an educator or an instructor in the classroom? Like, you know, I, like I said, I ask a lot of these questions. I'm continuously looking for ways to improve my own teaching. So the one thing that I do is I do a lot of peer review of teaching. What that means is I will actually invite other professors 
and and not only that many of you know professors from other departments you know i will invite ask them to sit in on my classes even on my zoom class and give me feedback on my teaching and you know that, once again because in the north american culture it's a much more direct task oriented culture i get very very good suggestions and it only helps me to uh, you know better or make tweaks and take those suggestions and make things better at the same time um, at least in the united states all uh, in all colleges and universities every professor is getting evaluated by students at the end of the semester for every class and those scores are actually a part of our performance evaluation so every year all of this data is collected so i am going to show you like you know how i use my teaching evaluation scores um you know so this is from two semesters so uh, our teaching evaluation scores are based on five like from one to five or zero to five whatever but at the same time when the scores are reported uh, actually what happens is we also get to see what is the the mean score for the department in my case it is the school of hospitality business management or the department of international business and what is the mean for the college that means so these are my scores hbm 280 hospitality systems class hbm 31 hospital leadership class so 4.9 4.8 4.8 4.9 this is the department mean 4.5 4.5 4.2 and this is the carson college of business mean so uh, scores are always reported like that so i kind of know first of all this is a great graphical or visual representation of you know what i am doing for example you know as it, as you can see there is a consistency in both of the semesters spring 2021 and fall 2020 this class registered 4.9 you know so that means there is a consistency so if you start plotting this data and then you are actually evaluated against your peers or your co colleagues in the department and then your colleagues in the entire college so in our system because everything is intensely competitive and performance based is that you know the higher you are away from this it is better for you the closer you are and especially if this was dropping below this then my boss will call me in and say we we need to have a talk you know we have a problem so uh uh so so um uh, uh so so yes uh, uh i'm looking at a couple of things please brief on high flex method yeah, i'll i'll talk about it um yeah, and and i see professor uh, deswal has made a comment we don't bear ourselves a social audit and it does require courage and seeking to excel yeah. so so yes i mean you know this is a part of um, of, of american academic life uh, and this can be very brutal because once again this is not about one semester or one class you know you are getting to see this at the end of every semester and when you are going up for promotion for tenure all of this data will be pulled through and as you can see this is not in vacuum you are actually seeing exactly where the department mean is and where the college mean is does anyone have any comments about this type of who, i know most institutions in india do not do this but are there are there people in this audience whose institutions actually have a course evaluation tracker like this where you get not only your own score but also you get to see uh, what's the department mean and the college mean or what do you think about this system these things are important folks because how would you improve if you don't know what you are doing let me look at is there any comments coming in So do you think institutions in India should start implementing a system like this? Yes, no, maybe. So yes, uh, in India also there should be such tracking systems. I think it's very important to uh, evaluate teachers as well. I mean, uh, according to me, it's purely my personal opinion. That uh, 
you know, just a moment. Uh, there was a disturbance in the background. So uh, when we, you know, in India, when we, if we will have such a system, I think we will have a more holistic learning rather than, you know, just a, uh, a unidirectional teaching classrooms. We will have a more holistic learning wherein students will be also a participant in, uh, uh, in the entire teaching process. So this is purely my personal opinion. So good morning, sir. Hey. Can I Very say good. a few Go words, ahead. sir? Please. Now, Come, AC, yeah. now AACT, AACT has introduced one feedback system, sir, that is 360 degree feedback. Their uh, students say, you know, sir, will part, will, will have a major say, sir, about the performance of the teachers. I think you might be knowing this AACT 360 degree feedback system that is going to be implemented from this academic year onwards, sir. Uh, the performance of the teachers will be assessed by the students, by the HOD, by the head of the institution, and by the students also. So students will have a major say, sir. And uh, no, it's a systematic evaluation, sir, of uh, teachers' performance. Uh, I think this will do a lot in improving the uh, education system, sir. Thank you so very much. We do, uh, good morning, sir. This is Dr. Rashmi. We do have a system like this, evaluation system for the faculties at our university and school. So it is divided into multiple components like teaching environment, teaching curriculum, teaching pedagogies used by the faculties, uh, how friendly is the atmosphere, you know, um, uh, the infrastructure facility which is provided to a student. So it's more student oriented and then like we are evaluated on our research papers uh, by the director as well as our fellow colleagues on our behavior. So this is the system which we have been following since quite some time. Uh, except for last year, we tried the online, but we were not so very successful. Probably this year, a retry may be done and, you know, that would kickstart a different sort of uh, system, you know, but this is beautiful. And completely. Thank you. Thank you sir. sir, I wish to add on something here. I mean, uh... No doubt, because of such systems and such professors like you, uh, the School of Hospitality of Washington State University is amongst the top schools in the world. Uh, in India, I would be happy to share that all our universities, rather higher education institutes, now have uh, internal quality assurance cell. And that's a mandatory requirement by University Grants Commission. So through that internal quality assurance cell, we do have uh, some systems to assess uh, teachers as well. So there is a student's feedback performer. Of course, they vary from institutions to institution. So at our university, I would like to mention that uh, the director of internal quality assurance cell is involved in almost all activities so that uh, he can be systematically roped in and we can have feedbacks to it. And uh, then uh, the, that evaluation is not merely from the uh, students, but from the stakeholders and other parameters also. Uh, though that's uh, 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 maybe once in a semester, at the end of the semester, we are doing it. And based on that, uh, along with other evaluations, we have NEC. So we rank our institutions uh, with the NEC accreditation and NIRF uh, framework. So that's how we are doing it. Uh, but of course, this approach is a little different. And yes, we can have a lot many things to uh, inculcate into our system from this. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, and just to just to clarify, I am just showing you the quantitative data. Uh, our, uh, our evaluations for each class usually has around 56 items which students are responding on. And then, of course, under each section, which was mentioned among the participants, then the students can write comments. And I, I in the interest of time and interest of the presentation, I am not going to the, uh, you know, the qualitative comment analysis. I'm just showing you how it is done uh, because, you know, you are getting a reflection or you are being measured not in a vacuum, but against your colleagues in the department or the school or and, and, the, and the college or university at a, as, as a whole. So um, moving on. I just want to talk a little bit about intentional pedagogy because this is very important, you know, since we are talking about um, on online teaching and um, teach, teaching and learning. So intentional pedagogy is, and somebody asked about high flex. High flex is a is a is a combination of. Let me just go back. Uh, we were talking about high flex. High flex is 
simultaneous when I'm teaching in the classroom, but also at the same time, I'm transmitting my teaching from the live classroom through Zoom or WebEx or something like that, because you know, now many institutions are actually doing that. And, and, the, and the way you want to actually use intentional pedagogy is that you are asking the question, what is it that I want my students to learn? And how am I going to make sure that they're learning it? There are different ways of pedagogical approaches. I am just showing one that I use um, uh, a lot um, in my, I do these kinds of faculty development programs around the world. I call it ROPES. So ROPES stands for review. That means you do a warm-up activity, start the session with a review of last session. I said, I log into the class five minutes before. Hey, what's going on? How are you? I saw that, you know, whatever, you know, you won that contest or you won that award, you know, chit chatting with the students, warming them up at the top of the class. I will tell them that this is what's going to happen today. You know, I will start with a review of the last session. Uh, this is what we learned last time. And then overview is that, you know, this is what's going to happen today. I am going to, you know, do a lecture for 30 minutes. Then we are going to bre break into small groups. We are going to, uh, you know, do our little case study. Then we gather back. You know, we will do some sharing and then we'll have a quick assessment activity and that's we are going to end class. So then I'm going to do the presentation of the content. And here I use a strategy once again derived from um, educational psychology called chunking. Chunking means, and let me give you an example why chunking is important. Chunking means you break up your content in nuggets uh, of five to seven minutes. Why? Because the average attention span of an American college student in the year 2020 was actually seven minutes. You know, there's a lot of research that we do that how long, you know, uh, is, is our student's attention span. So if you know that their average attention span is seven minutes, then there is, if you're doing a lecture for 45 minutes, it doesn't make sense at all. They will, they will simply tune out. And now that, you know, in this online environment, it is even even tougher to do that because you know people's head hurts. I mean, you know they don't want to be, uh, they don't they don't want to be um, actually uh, uh, be tied into all of all of these kinds of stuff. So uh, so yes, it is very important to actually do the chunking. Um, what's the average attention span of an Indian college student? Can somebody answer the question for me? I'm curious. Thirty minutes, sir. Okay, and where does this data come from? Somebody said 30, somebody said 15. No, I mean, can you cite, uh, uh, cite a credible source? Sir, no, that's sir, that, that's uh, psychology. any credible sources uh, we have to uh, share, so it's, it's not in my notice at least. Okay. So there is, so there is are, one people... psychological study, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. There is one psychological uh, study that says that uh, mind takes many vacations every 20 minutes, sir. But I'm not sure about Indian students. Uh, as you said, American students, you know, that span is, is extended up to seven minutes, but uh, we are not sure about Indian students, sir. Right. And that's why, you know, you, you basically want to present your content in bits or nuggets of seven to 10 minutes, then break into something else. Like you have noticed that, you know, I am doing a two hour session today, but I am taking breaks and I'm throwing questions at the audience. Otherwise, this will be a monologue of a, of a guy in a bow tie from America, like a 20 minute, uh, two, two, two hour long, blah, blah, blah. And he's going to put all of you into sleep, you know? So I am using, of course, you are all adults and you know, the content is different. I am using some kind of a chunking strategy where I designed the curriculum in a way that after a few slides, I'm taking a pause and say, what do you think? You know, uh, and then stuff like that, letting the audience respond and all these kinds of things. So this is some sort of an example of chunking. It is not possible to do that every time for every class. That's okay, as long as you understand the concept of chunking, you are breaking up your information so you are not that professor talking PowerPoint for the 45 minutes because it does not help learning at all. Then after your presentation, you have to do an evaluation, evaluate what they learned in an online environment. You have lots and lots of things, polls, quizzes, 
chat feature, uh, other softwares, Mentimeters, and all of that. One of the things I actually do is I will have students actually switch their cameras on for the evaluation, and I use what we call TED uh, or TED. That means when somebody says something, I'll say, tell me more, or explain what you mean, or define that for us. You know, that kind of draw, draws that student in, and then they can clarify, then they can expand on their thought process, and I, as the instructor, can check whether they're getting the concept or not. Because most of the courses I teach now are at the, at the higher level, so we are dealing with a lot of constructs, a lot of theories, a lot of, you know, a lot of pretty in-depth learning. So this, like when I do the TED, tell me more, explain what you mean, define that for us. I also kind of knowing whether they're getting the concept or not. And then I always like to end my online sessions or my virtual sessions with uh, summarizing the key points. Okay, this is what we learned today. And then I provide a heads up about what's going to happen and in the next session. So as you see in the ropes uh, uh, construct, we are starting with a review, then we are doing an overview. We are presenting whatever is the content that you want to present. Then you are evaluating what the students learned. And this is a good time to actually, if you need to clarify, we need to reinforce something, you can do that. And then you are summarizing. So that, you know, that's a strategy. There are different models out there. So you know, if this model is not something that works for you or that type of content you teach, you can look at other models as well. Another thing that I uh, use a lot in my, my teaching, this is my personal preference, is, um, is what I call the visual storytelling as a pedagogical tool. Like one of the things you know, at the top of the presentation when we were doing introductions, Professor Daya said that you know, I travel a lot and because I travel a lot, I do all of these lectures or do all of these consulting projects around the world, I get to experience a lot of cool stuff. So I always take pictures and I think very carefully um, that how can I use this picture or use this example to drive home a point. So here is a, here is a real life example uh, from, from one of my classes. So in visual storytelling, you know, what you need to do, if you want to use an example like this, you have to be very, very clear that what are you trying to use this example for? So what is the learning objective? What is the narrative that you are going to use? So what is the visual that you are going to use? What effect are you, you know, expecting from the students? And evaluation, was the intended learning objective achieved? Now, let me give you an example from uh, you know, one of my travels and you know, one of the theories that I teach, how I use visual storytelling. So in one of my upper division classes, in the senior capstone class, um, I, I, use a, I teach a theory called the theory of economic distinctions with Pine and Gilmore. So in the theory of economic distinctions, we are helping students understand how basically, you know, the, the economies have moved from commodity based, you know, before industrial revolution, then became a goods economy, then it became a service economy. And finally, we are now in an experience economy stage. So in service economy, like you know, all of you have traveled or stayed at a hotel or a restaurant or something like that, in service economy, they are basically delivering intangibles. Like, like you know, when we say, we went to that restaurant, we had a great meal, uh, fantastic. And that's delivered on demand. But you know, in the experience economy, the idea is just not to deliver intangible services, but to actually stage memories and you want your customer or your guest to go away with sensations. Now, you know, I am just, just shortening this whole, whole thing just for the sake of example. We, we would take a whole class period to look at the theory of economic distinctions. And then, you know, this, is, this, is, this can get complicated for undergraduate students to grasp. So many times they will ask me, so can you give us an example of how a service can become a world-class outstanding experience. And I sometimes use this story. I say, well, a few years ago, I was in Macau, China. I was staying at the Four Seasons Hotel. Four Seasons is one of the top most luxury brands in the world. And I uh, arrived at the hotel very late. I had to go to a conference reception that evening. 
and I noticed that my shoes were dirty. And so it is a Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, I called the guest services and I said, you know, can you shine my shoes? And they said, not a problem, sir. When do you need it by? I said, maybe within an hour. So, they sh so within 45 minutes, there was a knock on my door, but my shoes were delivered like this. So this is an example of how a simple service, you know, thousands of hotels around the world are providing shoe shine service, but the Four Seasons as a brand decided they will take a shoe shine example, a shoe shine service and elevate it to an outstanding world-class experience. And, you know, this is essentially the, the wow or the aha. So I am using this visual storytelling as a pedagogical tool to actually teach a pretty complex theory, business theory, using one of my personal stories. And, and, and once again, you know, learning objective. What was my learning objective in using this picture from my personal travel? Glean an understanding of the theory of economic distinctions. What is the narrative? Theory to example crossover. I am teaching the, I'm teaching the theory, then giving the example and showing them how you elevate a service and make it to a world-class experience. Visual, what visual am I going to use? First, the theory graphics, you know, uh, we, and then followed by the, uh, the, the, the shoe, the, the picture that I took. What effect am I expecting from students? Wow, like usually when I show this to students, usually they're completely blown away. And then evaluation, guided questions, like I will show this picture and I will let this picture be, and then I'll ask students, what are you seeing in this picture? Let's analyze this picture. What does it say about guest service? What does it say about branding? What does it say about process? What does it say about innovation? So as you can see, this is not a random picture about Professor Deepro's travel. You know, there is a very, very detailed pedagogical strategy in using this picture or using this visual storytelling as a tool to reinforce learning. What do you guys think? Is this, is this good? Is this good stuff? In fact, this is all research based. What is that? So it is very much useful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Sir, so I, yes, so, I wish to say something here. I, I, I yes, think it's, go it's, it's a good time and a platform to acknowledge it also. That shoe story which you shared, it not only inspired your many students across the globe, but also one distinct learner of yours, that's me. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I got to know about this, uh, when we met last time at Delhi, uh, I practiced this in my university institute, sir, and believe me, it made miracles. In a way, how miracles happen, that whenever uh, hotels and other companies used to come for campus placements, understanding the diversity of the students from different backgrounds and many coming from rural places. So every morning they were insisted and they used to polish their shoes. But then walking down the lanes in the village, coming through the fields yeah. and traveling in a bus or public transport and traveling on foot. By the time they were to the university campus, they were again filled with dust. So with this story, what I, uh, uh, what inferences I drew was that uh, the service commitments are indeed important and uh, how four seasons have won the heart of a scholarly professor like you. Uh, if we use it in our uh, practical living, that can do wonders. So in the washrooms of uh, my institute, I got some shoe shiners and shoe polishes placed. And whenever the companies used to come, I used to ask the students, go to the washroom first, get your shoes polished and then come back. And believe me, the uh, impact was amazing. So thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Daya. Yes, and as you can see, and, and let, me, let me make a couple of comments here. Like, you know, of course, I am very blessed and I'm very fortunate to be able to get these examples to my students. Um, but, you know, you don't have to travel to Paris or London to, or Dubai to be able to do that. There are so many examples around us, you know, around your homes, around your cities. You just have to have a very keen eye to observe. Like, I have hundreds and hundreds of examples, Professor Daya knows that. I mean, you know, like in India, I do work with Oberoi Hotels and Leela and all of that stuff. So 
I, I am a voracious collector of all of these examples. And I always think, okay, where can I use this example? You know, what theory is going to go in? And if you're, if you're asking me now, why do you even do this? It's very simple, folks. One of mo the most influential professors in my life, Dr. David Johnson, once told me, people do not remember information, they remember stories. Let me repeat. People do not remember information, they remember stories. And once again, since you are you know, in the business of teaching and learning, remember, information without context has no meaning at all. You know, I can, I can talk about theory of economic distinctions for two hours, but okay, for my undergraduate student, how do I contextualize this? How do I use this theory? Does this theory have an application in real life? Yes, here it is. Information without context has no meaning at all. And, and especially, you know, I teach in an AACSB accredited business school, which is, you know, very few business schools in the world are AACSB accredited. Our accreditation bodies are watching us very closely in how we teach, you know, what learning uh, outcomes are being achieved and all of that kind of stuff. So once I'm saying that engage teaching, you know, I can, it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching this on Zoom or WebEx or whatever, now you can see that it is possible to actually deliver engaged teaching. Yes, my friends, this is a lot of work because as you see, I just did not randomly pick up this picture. I asked all of these questions that, you know, how am I going to combine this theory with this picture and what's the learning objective, what's the narrative, what's the visual? So once again, quality teaching, outstanding teaching is not easy. It's a lot of work, you know? So I'm just saying that this is not something you can just wake up five minutes before class and deliver. Just not possible, you know? Just, just absolutely just not possible. So, so that's the reason I wanted to show you visual storytelling as a pedagogical tool. I was just teaching a class on artificial intelligence, you know, not too long ago. And instead of, you know, giving them th theories, I showed them a hotel, sorry, a restaurant reservation I did not too long ago using the Google's duplex artificial intelligence. So basically, I actually, you know, initially Google asked me whether uh, it wanted me to do the reservation. I took a screenshot. Then the second screenshot is the assistant is working on your request. When Google actually called the restaurant and they had a seamless conversation, the restaurant person did not even know they are talking to an artificial intelligence machine, you know, because Google can now understand the nuances of human voice. It can say things like, mm hmm, okay, aha. Uh -huh. I mean, you won't even know you're talking to an AI. And then as soon as the restaurant confirmed the reservation over the phone, it gave me a notification that your reservation at South Fork restaurant is confirmed. So rather than you know, giving them uh, whatever, a massive theory on AI, this is how it is done. You know, it is a much more powerful thing to do. Once again, are you using the power of story and visual? Because remember, our lives are nothing but collections of stories. We all have stories and students connect better when you are personalizing, you know, the content or the curriculum you are teaching. Uh, that's the, you know, the best teachers of the world, uh, in the world are the people who tell the most engaging and effective stories. That's a fact of life. I want to skip the case study because we don't have time. The final thing that I want to talk about is effective communication, how to build your virtual presence. Now, and before I um, finish this segment, I would like to um, like to state very clearly that I am going to talk about technology here, and I completely understand that the technology or the resources that you know I have access to or we have access to in North America, a lot of people in the world simply do not have access to these kinds of technology. But nevertheless, like I always tell people that you know, building your virtual presence is very important. What that means, that investing in infrastructure for uh, success, equipment, what equipment we are going to use. Many of you, I know people here are attending from a variety of institutions. Some of you, central universities or IITs have much more resources than maybe a smaller public government college in rural India. But also, irrespective of what you are using as equipment, you have to understand a few things that WebEx, Zoom, Google Meet, whatever, 
you know, you have to be very careful about virtual aesthetics in a sense that using virtual background, like why did, why did I blur my background today? Very simple because, you know, I use a very high end 4K camera and if I blur my background, it's actually going to focus right onto me. I have been doing these things for a while, so I know what the picture is going to look like. Lighting, very important. In just a minute, I will show you the setup I have both at home, where I am teach, where I am doing this session from, and, and, and in my office. Professional attire, you know, I teach in a, a top business school. I believe that it is important for me to look professional. Professional attire is not about vanity. It is not about wearing brands. It is about being looking professional. That's my personal choice. And, and once again, um, how you dress is absolutely your personal choice. You know, I choose to do this. I mean, I travel all over the world and, and I like, you know, when Professor Dahiya invited me to the conference at Maharshi Dhananand University, it was a very hot day, but I still wore a suit and a bow tie, didn't I, Professor? Uh, there. So because, <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Because you know what? If he had taken the trouble to invite me to come deliver a keynote at his university, at the least I can do, I was traveling in an air-conditioned car from Delhi to MDU. So it's not that big of a deal for me. I mean, you know, and we, as soon as I arrived at IITTM at MDU, once again, everything is air-conditioned. No big deal. But, you know, it is important for me to build a professional presence, as simple as that. Once again, that's my personal choice. Um, how other faculty, you know, we have, a, like even in Washington State, there are a lot of my colleagues who doesn't care. I mean, they will wear a polo to class. That's their personal choice. Communicating virtually, preparation is very important in a sense that that's the reason I logged in 15 minutes before. Um, WebEx is a new, this is not a format that I normally use. I made sure that I understand, you know, how to work the PowerPoint. Is the camera focusing rightly? Uh, also, absence of body language and nonverbals. That means there's, there'll be an absence of audience reaction. I won't be able to see. So that means there is no interaction or energy. And finally, digital etiquette. Clarify at the beginning of the semester what you expect from students. Do you want them to keep their cameras on or off? Like in my classes, I know it gets very tiring. I tell students, you can keep your cameras off unless you are talking to me or a guest speaker. When you are engaging as part of digital etiquette, you know, you have to keep your camera on. So it's a sweet spot between, you know, uh, that they can keep their camera off during the lecture, but then turn it on. Let's look at some setups. This is the setup I have at home where I am coming from. So as you can see, I have two ring, newer ring lights on both sides of my work desk. You know, I actually have a 4K 48 inch a carved screen so that I can split all of this stuff. I can have three or four, like a PowerPoint, a Zoom, and all of these things going. Um, I actually use that Logitech Brio 4K camera. 4K, if you're not familiar, very high-end laptop cameras are actually 1080p. A 4K is four times the resolution. So even if you have bad internet, you should still be able to see me pretty well because the image is very sharp. Then for audio, this is a studio setup microphone. This is a Blue Yeti stereo microphone on a cardioid setting and all of that. And I have all of the other things going here. I have a very high-end Sony headset. You know, um, I have all of the other stuffs here. Uh, and I use actually a Dell XPS 1TB, um, you know, computer, which is very high computing power because I have three or four devices going together at the same time. So you, I, I mean, I, you don't see my, uh, you will see my tablet here and all of that kind of stuff. Very important to understand, bandwidth is of course important, video, your students should be able to see you clearly. More important, audio, they should be able to hear you very clearly. So if you have not, I would always encourage people because now the cost of it, well, I mean, you know, this is a $600 uh, headset, you don't need that. Uh, you know, you can actually get something much more affordable but it is important that you know you have good audio, and at the same time, lighting is very important. You know, like when I started at 8:30, because here the sun set is after 9 p.m., but now it is almost close to 10:30 p.m. It's dark outside. But as you can see, my picture is pretty well lit because I have two newer ring lights. 
And these ring lights are adjustable. They have adjustable between hot and cold. I can change the intensity and all of that kind of stuff. So this is the, so technology definitely helps. So if you have access to these type of resources, invest in them, absolutely. My office, very similar, though I don't use my office at all because you know we are working from home. As you can see, I have a giant curved screen, 4K camera. And does anybody know what this green thing is? Any guess what, what this green thing is? Green screen. No, it's not a green screen, man. This green thing looks like a light. Anybody? It's actually a 4K document camera. So I can actually plug it into WebEx or Zoom. And as I'm teaching, if I want to write something and show it under the camera, I can do that. You know? So once again, there's a lot of like, you know, now I'm getting up, getting some newer technologies. You know, I'm going to have a um, um, ATEM Mini Pro to split so that, you know, I can transmit video. But I have been doing this for several years now. So I, th I think I'm a pretty good, um, you know, decent understanding of technology. So if you are starting out or if you do not have access to these resources, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Finally, as we are ending this session, you know, um, teaching and learning is great. Technology is great. All of those constructs and theories are great. But great communication in an online hybrid environment is the one where the instructor or the teacher is also um, communicating things like empathy, patience, inclusivity, and kindness. Like one thing I have learned through my long career, people will not remember what you did to them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So your students may or may not remember what you taught or you know, what, what theories or what a great scholar you are. They will always remember how you made them feel. Did you treat them with respect? Did you treat them with kindness? You know, did you show empathy? Um, did you have patience with them? So in the end, you know, teaching and learning is not ab only about all of these theories, all of this, whatever, $30,000 technologies. In the end, it is a human experience. So it is very important that whether you are teaching in person, whether you are teaching online, you know, whether teaching virtually, that this is what you do. And that brings me to the end of this session. I'm so sorry I went over one minute um, I know that we were supposed to break exactly at 11 uh, a.m. there. So once again, my apologies. I went over by one minute. Professor Doya, I apologize. Sir, dil to karta hai ki aapko sunte hi jaye, sunte hi jaye, sunte hi jaye. But then, before I say a few words, there is a very short video, which I think, in your honor, and sharing the feelings of all participants, I must do that. So please allow me to share that screen and uh, let me play that video for you. It's in your honor, sir, and they are the feelings of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.